The 1950s and 60s saw an influx of young Irish men and women into Britain. Many left their homes at a very young age, venturing into the unknown to pursue a new life. As a third generation Anglo-Irishman, I've always been intrigued by the influence that influx had on the society that I grew up in, in North London. So much so that I wrote my final history dissertation based around the topic. Many of my favourite musicians boasted Irish surnames. Most of my favourite places in London began as Irish venues. And just this summer, there was a considerable Anglo-Irish representation in the English football team that almost brought the beautiful game home. I wanted to investigate the impact that Irish migration in the 50s and 60s had on my city and subsequently on my life, from where I went to what I listened to. The logical place to start was the beginning of my own story, by speaking to someone close to me, hearing their own experiences of migration and integration into British society, and to see where that would take me. The early 1950s saw an influx of young Irish men and women emigrate to England in search of employment and opportunity. Many of these migrants were under 18 and were fleeing the harsh youth justice system in place across the Irish Sea at the time. I spoke to my granddad Kevin, one of 13 children, about crime and punishment in post-war Dublin. We met up with five other kids on the street and in the afternoon we all went to the picture house. We had cigarettes, money, yo-yos, torches, everything. And uh, we got arrested in the cinema, the Tivoli Cinema in Dublin, it was in Francis Street. They took us to the police station. We spent all day in the police station. It all came out what we'd done. We went, after that, we went to court. And I was sent, sent down for a month to a, a place called Marlborough House, which is like a remand home over the north side, north side of Dublin, Glass and Evan, that side of it. And my other brother, Joel, he was with me. And he, the two of us got a month each in Marlborough House. Marlborough House served as a remand school for first time offenders. Children would often be sent there for up to a month for petty crimes. The law was heavy handed with focus on deterring as opposed to reforming young children. When they picked me up, or must have been a month after when they picked me up, they knocked on the door one morning. I wasn't expecting it. Think they got me. Uh, so, Kevin, I went, and they picked me. Yes, you were in the car. And the other fella, he lived down the street, and I was hoping he was in. <laughs> I didn't want to get and uh, I finished up out in the police station, Nace, till about 12 o'clock at night. And a grilling you coming in and out. I mean, the, I remember it. The cell was covered in blood. Whether they put it there or not, I don't know. You know, and I was 12 years old. What, what it was, if you'd spent some time in Marlborough House, what I told you earlier on, a month in Marlborough House, then you went back to the court again. That's where you went, down to Dane. And, uh, that's the time then, it was my time to come to England. St Conleth's Reformatory School in Dangan, County Offaly, was one of many industrial schools across Ireland. Run by Christian Brothers, in 2000 it was investigated as part of the Commission to Inquire into Child Abuse. Kevin's brother David was sent there for seven years from the age of nine. After arriving in England, Kevin tried many times to write to David, but years later, found out his letters never reached him. As I said, I, when I got here, I used to write to David, not a lot, and uh, nothing. And I, I really felt guilty in a way for him because he, he never come home, never come home for the weekend, you know, and he stuck out there. And I can imagine, they were no good bastards, they were my cold cup bastards. They were, I was Christian brothers, because we had them at our local school. They were the same rare local school, the same ones. And why they call them Christian, I don't know. Devil brothers. Well, they they should, should, well. No, they should have called them devil brothers, honestly. They were really vicious, wicked, pedophile, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. they were. To avoid being sent to Dangan, Kevin left for England at just 12 years old. Upon arrival, he was alone in London and was told to meet his older brother, Huey, who'd already moved over 
at Euston Station. However, his initial arrival was far from smooth. Because I lost the address of where you lived. I remember bits of it. And she 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 mentioned Seven Sisters Road and Hornsey Road. This is true. A bus has come along. It was a 14 bus, and that used to run from Hornsey later on I found that to Putney, but it come up the Euston Road and I thought I'd see seven, I'd get on there. And I said, I remember saying Seven Sisters Road. And he said, Well, wait, you know how long Seven Sisters Road is. <laughs> And then he, I said, well, and he mentioned, rattled off, and then he said, Horn, I said, that's it, Hornsey Road. Just the same. I still didn't have an address. I walked around for about two and a half, three hours. Great Crescent, that's the turn in where Huey lived, and my other brother lived down there, where Chris. I walked down there, looking out the window, was my sister-in-law, Kevin. Looking, looking. Hey, it was just all... I should have been there. Upon arrival in London in the 50s and 60s, many of those who made the journey naturally gravitated towards areas that had historically drawn Irish immigrants. Irish workingmen, since the Victorian times, had found work as navigators and construction workers, helping to build London's canal systems and railroads. Thus, they naturally settled in areas near to where the work was, areas such as Camden Town and Cricklewood. Now, I heard the idea of the Irish being separated into their own pubs in the 60s was a bit of a myth. Is it, is it strictly true? Uh, it, it is, because the, the, uh, the Victorians, bless them, when they were building the, the railway from Euston there, um, the cuttings in Camden Town, the, the railway cuttings, are the deepest in the country. And uh, the English, the Irish, the Scottish and the Welsh were all fighting each other for the best jobs. You know, and it was tough all going and stuff. And unfortunately, Camden Town was a bit of a war zone. And the railway company decided to put the, uh, each nationality into their own um, bars. You know, keep the peace a little. Uh, a little bit like apartheid back in the day. Emery's pub, the Dublin Castle, was one of four pubs named after castles in Camden Town. The other three being the Windsor Castle, the Edinburgh Castle and the Pembroke Castle. They were segregated to stop the different nationalities of railway and canal workers from fighting one another. In the 50s and 60s, however, an Irish diaspora had been established in certain areas of London, such as Camden Town and conflict was much less commonplace. My um, grandma was from West Cork, a place called Skull, and my granddad was from Clooning in Bohola in County Mayo. Mm -hmm. When they came in the 68, um, they were quite welcomed to the Irish community, mm -hmm. and they felt quite happy being amongst their own people. Um, yeah, it was very Irish in their day. Oh yeah, well, Camden Town was, was you know, traditionally an Irish town. And uh, uh, especially in the 50s, my, my father came over, uh, he was stowaway on a cattle ship. He left Ireland when he was just on 18 years old, borrowed a viver, and uh, stowed away, landed in, in, in Chester, and was started digging, because that's all he could do, and uh, eventually moved down to, to London. So when my uh, grandmother came over, she came and worked in the National Temperance, which would be known as the UCH now. And my granddad wasn't long after, he came in 1951, but his work was in construction before it was in pubs. Um, they met in the Buffalo, uh, which is now known as the Electric Ballroom in Camden. They ended up digging tunnels. They were doing dangerous work because they had nothing else to do, you know, and, and the money was great. and and. They were mighty diggers and they had arms out here, all of them, you know, they were crikey. And trade for Irish pubs is very good. Was Camden Town important in terms of Irish workers getting work? If you wanted a job on a Monday morning, that's where you turn up. You turn up there and the, the lorries, lorries would come along and then you, 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 and take you out to a job. Yeah, that's how they done it, yeah. 
but as the decades went on, the um, the Irish community dwindled as they moved out to other areas and that, and my father decided to diversify from having just Irish music in the back room to um, a bit of jazz, a bit of rhythm and blues, and blues, and trying this, that and the other, and it was uh, scorned upon to start with because it was an Irish house. So we had to keep going. Through speaking to many of the third and second generation Irish, a common theme began to emerge in that their first generation parents and grandparents met in Irish dance halls such as the Galtimore in Cricklewood and the Buffalo in Camden Town. I wanted to find out more about these venues and the role they played in the Irish community. My grandmother came over in the, in the 50s. I don't, know, I don't know too much about when, when my granddad came over, but they, they, uh, they both lived in Cricklewood, which is a heavily, heavily Irish area. And they, they met in the Galtie Moor, which is obviously a very popular night, I suppose. But. They met in the Buffalo, uh, which is now known as the Electric Ballroom in Camden. But the one, well, the main one, was in Camden Town. And I found out why they called it the Buffalo. It was uh, an Irish uh, centre before, uh, it was an Irish centre, not uh, as such. And before that, it was a, a Buffalo Lodge. You heard of the Buffalo Lodges? They're these funny shaking hand people, you know, Masons, that's exactly what they were. And they kept the name. When, when uh, the Irish centre, they kept the name of... Uh, the Buffalo. So everyone knew it was the Buffalo. It is the electric ballroom now. Yeah, but every Saturday night was a fight in there. Guaranteed. Guaranteed a fight. They didn't sell drink in there. You had to go in there drunk. I think they wouldn't let you in unless you was drunk. I read about a riot in 1963 at the Buffalo and Jim Reeves pulled out playing there, I think. It was there often violence at these kind of places? You know, there was also, in the, in the Irish community, there was tension because you'd have Kerry boys that want to fight the Mayo boys and they'd want to fight the Dubs and, and, and there was always tear ups here there and out you know, all over the show but generally it was quite peaceful was there a right way to do it you know the dancing was it like a ritual did people line up and pick their partner yeah they don't the, wi the women would on one side of the dance hall, and the men on the other side of the dance hall. And then when it was take your partners, it would be a big rush over <laughs> to the men and go, and you get women go, nope, <laughs> you want to dance? Nope, <laughs> nope, nope, nope. And what it was, you danced, you danced sort of clockwise. They got to go around to the right. If you go to the left, you, it's wrong. You got to go to the right. And uh, I'll tell you a little story where you're watching... Uh, this fella, he was drunk and he was hanging over this girl dancing around. Anyway, he got sick all down her back. So, <laughs> all down her back. And thank you for the dancing. She just went off smiling. She didn't know. Said so she went back to her friends. But it was always a fight in there. A friend of mine, we got into a fight there one night. And uh, a mate of mine, Peter Little, that's a fella, he got the top of his nose bitten off. Yeah. So what happened in the end? They seemed to just die out after a while. They seemed to. They just seemed to die out. And uh, I'd say the late 70s, 80s, 80s, yeah, they died out. People didn't go. Don't forget the, the Irish stopped coming over here because of the Celtic Tiger. They called it the Celtic Tiger when the economy picked up, picked up. And a lot of, a lot of people went back. Yeah, they went back. And then there was work over there for the youngsters as well. So they didn't come back here. So the Irish sort of contingent, uh, it's not like it, it was. Not like it was. As the popularity of the Irish dance halls in London dwindled, areas such as Camden were undergoing a rapid transformation. Camden itself was becoming a subcultural hub and was important in terms of subculture and music. I wanted to look at the venues that I'd visited and find out what role they played in this transformation of a once traditionally Irish area. I suppose the biggest change in Camden was the Camden Lock and the markets that came to 
Camden, which has been has made Camden like a real tourist attraction. And then you've got a real media and music hub area with the likes of MTV is across the road. And then you have lots of TV stations like Hattrick, Channel 4, that's up um, down at Oval Road. So, you know, Camden's a very um, music orientated area still to this day. In 1976, uh, my grandma and granddad moved back to Baholam at Cantemayo. And that summer, my parents came to London. Initially, it was supposed to be for summer. Um, they just finished their uh, leaving cert, but they ended up staying, and that was uh, they then took over running the pub. Um, my mum worked uh, first in the Midland Bank, and then trained on to be a nurse. But after my parents got married, she worked full time uh, with dad here in the pub. Um, I myself have been involved in the pub for about 15 years now, as well as my younger sister and brother Thomas and Ashley. Seen on the sign outside about the theatre upstairs. Is that something to do with you guys, or is that a completely separate thing? Well, years ago, before we had the theatre, um, it was a function room, and we um, decided then, I believe it was 35 years ago now, um, to convert it into a theatre. And we've had numerous uh, famous people walk through the doors, the likes of Ruby Wax, Jude and Claire, we all started their careers upstairs. and. It's been, it's even at the moment currently going on, we've got the Camden Fringe, which is on every August. And it's a lot of people preview here to go to Edinburgh. So it's a really good way of, you know, seeing how it works, seeing what people think of it. And yeah, pretty good. Just looking around the pub, there's a, a lot of artwork dedicated to a particular group. Is there a backstory behind that? In 1979, some young local lads 17 and 18 years old came in here and asked for a gig. Wednesdays were free and uh, my father asked, do you do any jazz? And they said, oh yeah, we do a bit of jazz. And that turned out to be madness. And uh, it's such a good crowd on a Wednesday night. They asked for the weekends. He said, no, but we can have another Wednesday night. So he gave them a residency every Wednesday. But they still wanted the Saturday night. But Dad knew that he'd sold out on a Wednesday. Just, he's going to have a good crowd anyhow at the weekends. And he wouldn't give it to them. But Madness were on uh, Top of the Pops then with The Prince, their first single. When he lost them then, it got too big. But they certainly put the Dublin Castle on the map. It was fascinating to me to discover how such a small number of Irish pubs in such a small area had an impact on London's cultural scene. I was intrigued to discover the ongoing influence these pubs were having and what the outlook looked like for the future. Does the Dublin Castle still have that kind of musical influence? Do bands still try and book their spot there and play on the stage here? People that uh, form a band in their bedroom or their, or their garage and then uh, hopefully perform for the first time here and, and uh, we get them out onto stage. But that might not be their their, their real tune or the, the sound they really want and bands blend and they break up and they get together and they meet other people with the same interests and they go oh we could try, try that and, and eventually you get the new uh, the new Brit pop sensation you know that goes on to the world stage because everywhere around the world you'll hear an Amy Winehouse song or a Coldplay song and they were in this little pub on that, on that little stage at one point. I suppose London's a melting pot already and I, I suppose Camden's just like a magnifying glass on that melting pot, I guess. The absolute, the absolute unapologetic nature of the people that drink around here or just uh, live around here is incredible because, you know, you could do a step, see a punk, do another step, see a family, do another step, See an old Irish person do another step, see someone else. It's, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know man, it's like London on steroids. I'm second generation Irish and I love going to Irish pubs in London and I think people that come from Ireland or have moved over appreciate coming to a pub that reminds them a bit of home and having that sense of welcoming as well is really important. So I think that we'll do well in the future, yeah.